Vandana, uh, uh, welcome. Uh, so uh, I think we've got a great speaker tonight. I just want to give a uh, shout out to Betsy George for recommending uh, Corinne uh, to speak with us tonight. Uh, so it was, I guess it was well over a year ago that Betsy uh, made the suggestion and, uh, and made the connection. And so uh, as programming chair, uh, I'm glad we were able to get Corin in with us tonight. So we're real honored to have you, Corin. Thank you for being here. So uh, so let me uh, just give a little brief introduction here. I think the introduction is, is exciting. You know, it prefaces up the talk very nicely. So our speaker tonight is Corin Bishop. Uh, and she were presenting using the iNaturalist to bring the Smokies alive. Uh, Corin works with, with, with a passion for both mission-driven work and the great outdoors. Her writing is heavily influenced by a sense of place as over time she has found home amongst California redwoods, Washington, D.C.'s uh, cherry blossoms, the Oregon's caves, South Dakota's badlands, and uh, Florida's Everglades and Tennessee Smoky Mountains. Corin was a 2020 writer in residence with, with the Sundress Academy for the Arts in Knoxville. Sharon's currently working on hiking, hiking every trail in the Smoky Mountains National Park and earning her certificate as a Tennessee naturalist. She has written for the Mrs. Ventures Magazine, Sierra Magazine, Smoky's Life and Fodder's Travels, among others. Uh, and I think in her presentation, you will learn about our naturalists our naturalist is a citizen science app that goes beyond the basic identification of plants, animals, and fungi and other species. So, Corinne, welcome to the South Carolina Native Plant Studies Up Chapter Upstate Chapter meeting, and we look forward to your talk. And again, thank you for being here. Hey, thank you so much for having me and uh, for the lovely introduction. Uh, before I get my slides up, I just wanted to mention that I also shared a file in the chat. Um, that has just a list of links to some various pieces of writing I've done, as well as different resources on iNaturalist and some of the park partners that I'm going to be talking about um, in my presentation. So just know in advance that you have um, access to all of that after the talk is over. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, um, so again, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, I'm gonna be talking about my experience using iNaturalist today and specifically um, within the beautiful Smoky Mountains, which I'm lucky to live um, right next door to. Uh, but first, before we dive in, I just wanted to give a quick overview of what iNaturalist is. Um, it sounds like from the chat earlier that a lot of you are already familiar with it. But in case you are new, um, iNaturalist, in, in a general sense, is a nature app and website that helps you identify plants and animals. It's also a community science platform. So that means that you can use it to collect data to help inform um, a variety of nature-focused projects. And it's also a social network. Um, so you're able to interact with other naturalists um, from beginner level to experts and learn about nature together. Um, and it's a joint initiative between the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic Society. So how I got introduced to iNaturalist. Um, <laughs> I, so as, um, as was mentioned earlier, I'm an outdoor enthusiast and I'm a full-time writer and editor. And a lot of my work focuses on um, environmental topics and outdoor adventures. I've had the opportunity to live in a lot of beautiful places. And um, when I moved to the Smokies, um, I did so with the help from a botanist friend who used to be uh, what I refer to as my personal iNaturalist. Um, her name was Steph and I would basically uh, text her a picture of something I saw and I'd ask her, what is this? <laughs> and she would text me back. Um, and usually she was pretty good. The accuracy was fairly high. So um, that was fun. But when she uh, moved with, me to the Smokies. Um, she went on a little hike with me and we were 
walking along and she identified crane fly orchids. And she told me that she knew to look for those because she'd seen them on this app called iNaturalist. Um, and so I kind of filed that away. It's like, I got to download that app. Um, Steph isn't always going to be around to identify these plants for me. So um, I did download it. And then as everyone knows, a global pandemic kicked in. And so I was in a new town um, trying to get connected to that space. And I started using iNaturalist a lot. Um, I was walking on urban greenways and using it a lot there. Um, and I started noticing a lot of invasive species when I was doing this. And I started to wonder how those might relate to what I see in the Smokies and how they spread. And so I ended up talking to some park staff about that and wrote about that experience for um, Sierra Magazine, which is in the resources list that I gave you as well. Um, and then I ended up through that, connecting with the Great Smoky Mountains Association um, and doing some writing about their Smokies Most Wanted initiative, which I'm gonna talk about today um, and which uses iNaturalist quite a bit. So um, that's kind of how I got into using it. Um, and before I go forward too, I'll just mention that I have worked with the National Park Service and I collaborate a lot with uh, various partners. Um, but I am just here today with my writer's hat on, um, not as an affiliate of any of those organizations. Um, they do put on some great uh, presentations though about uh, Smokey's Most Wanted. And I know that they've started doing some in person to it, some different REIs and stuff like that. So that's something to look into. All right, and my goal today is just to get you as jazzed about iNaturalist as I am. Um, I think that it's a really amazing tool and the more that I've learned about how public lands use it, um, both for education and land management, um, the more thrilled I am about the app. So I hope that after today, you will have at least one, if not many reasons um, to dive in. Um, so here's a little overview of what I'm gonna uh, go through today. I'm just gonna start with a, a brief overview of how to use iNaturalist. Um, there are a lot of features and you can get into the weeds with it, but I'm just going to go through um, kind of the basic process of setting it up and logging your first observation and then using a few of the key features. Um, so if you wanna have your, if you have a smartphone and you wanna have it out during that to kind of walk through it, um, that is fine with me. Um, it's a little bit easier if you've already set up an account and um, registered with it, but um, you'll also have access to this information afterwards if you haven't done that yet. Um, so after we go over that, I'm gonna touch on two ways that you can use iNaturalist to help the Smokies. So I'll talk more about tracking invasive species and then also the Smokies Most Wanted Initiative. And uh, then I'll talk about two ways that you can use it for your own benefit. Um, connection and of course writing since that's um, my specialty. And then we'll close it off with some next steps and resources and time for some of your questions. All right, um, so again, if you have a smartphone with you and you have the iNaturalist app downloaded, feel free to grab it now. Um, the first thing that you'll need to do is get the app, of course. It's on both um, app stores and it's a free download. Um, and you just register for an account. This is what the logo looks like if you um, are looking to make sure you have the right one. And once you get that all set up, um, when you open the app, it defaults to your My Observations page. And this is where it's going to list anything that you load into the app. Um, to record a new one, you're gonna click on that uh, green circle with the plus sign at the bottom right corner. And when you do that, it pulls up um, a little prompt that asks if you wanna take a photo, record a sound, or you can also upload um, any media that you already have on your phone. Um, I usually take photos um, directly there. I just find that the, the easiest for me. I have done a couple of sound recordings for birds as well. Um, because iNaturalist is also for all species. Um, I'm kind of doing plant focus tonight, but um, you can do insects and animals and fungi and, and all that good stuff too. 
So um, once you click how you'd like to upload your media, um, you'll get on a page like this. You can upload multiple photos, um, which I highly recommend. Sometimes I've really regretted getting out of the backcountry and only taking one photo and realizing it would be really nice to see what the underside of that leaf looks like um, to better my <laughs> odds of an identification. So as you'll see on this one, um, I have four different photos that I took um, of this plant up top. And um, again, look, so like looking, taking pictures of the leaves, um, the underside of the leaves, the stems, the flowers, anything um, that might help you with that identification uh, later if you don't have service. And the app will auto load um, the location of where you saw the, uh, the plant for whatever species you're uploading, as well as the date and time. Um, and then iNaturalist is supposed to be for uh, wild uh, plants. So if you are taking a picture of some pansies or something in your garden, that's great. But you just need to check that box to say that it is um, captive or cultivated so that um, that's taken into consideration if anyone's using the data for research. Um, and then you can also add some notes in. So if you see a plant out somewhere and you notice that it has a particularly strong fragrance or it has a particular texture. Those are notes that you can add into that um, other citizen science scientists can see and might also help you with your identification later um, if you don't have cell service at the time. So um, you have the parts that have kind of loaded in there automatically and then you'll also want to put in um, some sort of identification for what you're seeing. Um, and under the pictures that you upload, you'll see a little link that says unknown view suggestions. When you click on that, it will pull up, um, the artificial intelligence will pull up um, its best guesses for what you've seen. Um, and you can kind of scroll through those. Um, if you see one that you think might be what you found, you can click on it and um, it'll show you a page that has more information about that species. You can also click the compare button, um, which is really handy. It'll put your photos on top and the um, confirmed photos on the bottom. You can scroll through them and um, compare the, the two there to make sure that they look, look similar. Um, if you think that that is what you saw, you can click the select button and it'll load it back into your observation um, page for that. And then you just wanna make sure that you click that green check mark at the bottom and that will save um, your data. So after that, it's a little bit of a waiting game, which I know um, I heard that sometimes that is a challenging part of using iNaturalist. Um, you, but you'll want to check back occasionally to see if um, a fellow iNaturalist user has um, confirmed your observation or asked some other questions about it, or maybe even subject, suggested a different species. Um, it takes two confirmations of that species for um, the observation to be considered research grade. And once it's considered research grade, um, different institutions that are using iNaturalist data will pull that um, into their projects. Um, and they, they often do another round of, of review as well. So um, if they find something that looks a little bit off or something that um, it seems like we, there would need to be more data to really get down to that level of specificity, um, those teams will do that. But it's otherwise considered research grade. Um, and so here you can see on my, my observations list there um, for the cut leaves toothwort. Um, you can see that next to it, there's a little per, like kind of magenta shield. Um, and that means that there is a new comment on that or a new um, person adding their thoughts about what it might be. So that's one if I opened up the app that I click on and see um, what other iNaturalist users are saying. Um, and then the other two show um, where I gave my uh, thoughts that this was, a, I'd seen a lesser purple fringed orchid. 
Um, someone else confirmed that ID, and so that then moved into a research grade. All right. Um, so in addition to uploading your own observations in iNaturalist, um, you can also help others with their identifications. Um, that's part of this community science piece. Um, and to do that, you would click on the three lines in the upper left corner of the app, um, and that will open your navigation menu, which is what you're seeing here on the left. Um, and you'll click the Explore button. Um, that shows you uploads from other users, um, and it defaults to your current location and just all, um, all species there. Uh, so if you want to narrow it down a bit, you can do that. Um, in the example I have here on the right, um, I narrowed it down for plant all plants um, uploaded in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And um, so then I can kind of scroll through there and see if there's anything that I feel confident about um, IDing for somebody. Here you'll see that some of those um, some of those observations have the RG. Uh, green square in the corner, and that means they're already research grade. So if I'm looking at other people's observations and trying to um, confirm them, I'll usually look for ones that aren't already at that stage so that I can help move some other ones along. Um, and usually I'll, I'll kind of whittle it down even more than this. So if I'm really confident in um, IDing cut leaf Cone flowers, for example, I'll just look for those and see if there are any that haven't reached research grade yet. Um, so this is a, a great way to contribute to the platform and how it's able to help um, different public plans. So um, if you do feel confident with particular locations or species, um, it's great if you can go in there and um, help add some IDs. So another feature um, in iNaturalist that you can also access from that menu, that main navigation menu, are the guides, um, which I'm going to get into a bit more uh, when I talk about the Smokies Most Wanted initiative. And so you click on guides, and the best way I've found to interact with them is to click nearby, and that way you can just see what people have put together um, near you. Even if you're traveling, that will update as well. Um, and so you can search, or you can search by name if you're looking for a particular guide. Um, and these are basically different organizations or individuals might put together a guide that um, it will help people understand some of the main species within an area. Or, um, you know, on here it says moths of Georgia. So if you're interested in um, learning more about that, um, guides are a great way to just kind of get an overview of um, species of interest or species that are common in certain areas where you might be traveling. So here I, I clicked on the nearby option and I found the Smokies Most Wanted Guide. And um, as you see, if you click on that, it then opens up and shows uh, pictures of all the different species that are in that particular guide. And if you click on one of those, you get um, additional information about that species. Um, so the final um, kind of feature in iNaturalist that I'll go over for today um, are projects, and you can also access those in that navigation menu. Um, projects are um, particular initiatives or challenges that groups invite users to join. So for example, here in my projects, you'll see the City Nature Challenge 2020. So that was um, an effort to just see what's going on or showing up in city environments. Um, so walking along greenways, uploading. Um, I was finding a lot of Japanese knotweed. <laughs> um, so that's one example. Um, all of the National Park Service sites also have their own projects as well. Um, so I've pulled up Great Smoky Mountains um, project here. And that will give you a good sense of just how many observations have occurred in the park, um, what types of species you might see, um, different users who are um, contributing data there. So it's a good way to 
um, engage with that community and also get a sense for what you might be seeing. Um, but I will mention too that projects are optional. So um, they're a fun way to explore what's going on in certain places of interest. But for example, even if I didn't join um, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park project, uh, the park would still be able to access and use the observations that I upload that come from within the park um, since they are tagged to that location as well. Um, so that's one thing to note. Um, and then just a few more notes on using iNaturalist. Um, as I mentioned, it, it does work in airplane mode which uh, is a great feature for many reasons. Um, one is that if you're in the backcountry without service, um, it's nice to still be able to load your data in. Um, the app will still take your photo and it'll get the location and uh, load in the date and all of that. It'll basically hold it there um, until you get back to service and then open the app up and can start um, uploading that information. And um, two, <laughs> and this is, uh, this is to maybe give a different perspective on the waiting for results piece. Um, I think it's always really fun when I am hiking in places where um, I don't have service. I load in all of these iNaturalist observations. And then when I get home, it's like I get to experience this hike all over again. It's like a kid in a candy shop. Um, so I'll get home, I'll have the Wi-Fi on, upload all my stuff and start going through my different iNaturalist observations to um, come up with an ID that I think um, matches for these. And I usually also uh, then text them to Steph, um, who was my original iNaturalist. <laughs> so um, that can be a fun, um, fun feature if you're out there. And um, the app is also super handy in the field, but um, the desktop website version um, has some additional functionality that's worth checking out. Um, so this is a screenshot of what that um, homepage looks like. It can just be a little bit easier, I've found, to get more information on the species and to see notes that other naturalists are leaving on your observations and stuff like that. So. It's worth poking around. Um, if you follow some of your favorite naturalists or something too, you can also get a feed for what their latest um, uploads are, which is kind of fun. Um, and then seek versus the naturalist. Um, I also heard you all talk a bit about this in um, the chat beforehand. Um, so I did want to touch on it a little bit. Um, so Seek is also made by iNaturalist, same people. Um, and I, I actually personally haven't used Seek, but I always hear about, um, I'm always hiking with other people who are using it. And they do like, um, they, they've said that it's a bit more user-friendly and you can do some live IDs with it, whereas you do have to wait with iNaturalist. Um, the only thing is, um, and I heard this mentioned as well, is that unless you give it permission to, um, if you are making observations on Seek, it's not going to be syncing with iNaturalist. Um, and iNaturalist is what uh, parks and research institutions use for their, their projects. Um, so if you want your data and your observations to really make a difference for these public lands, it's really important to um, sync those two. And um, so if you are a Seek fan, you can definitely keep using it. Uh, but just make sure that you um, select that option so that you can be a part of that community science piece. Okay, um, so it's time to dive into all the reasons why I think you should love iNaturalist as much as I do. Um, and I'm going to start with talking a bit about tracking invasive species um, and how iNaturalist can help the park mitigate those issues. Um, and it was great that it already got brought up about the emerald ash borer and that being um, a first sighting in iNaturalist because I think that's a, a very powerful example of um, how we can be aware of, of what's coming. So what's in a name? <laughs> um, so as I, got, as I mentioned, when I really got into using iNaturalist, um, I was in more of an urban setting 
And I really started to notice those invasive species that were uh, lining the greenways. And that led to my piece first year about using Inaculus to prevent the spread of invasive species in the Smokies. Um, and I ended up using Multiflora Rose as my hook for that piece um, because I learned about how it aggressively outcompetes native plants and um, dries out critical wetland habitats. So it turns out that having that data on the more specific name of the rose you're looking at um, might actually show that it doesn't smell as sweet. Um, so a little overview on invasive species in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, the park is, the park manages about 80 different um, invasive exotic species, but most of them are actually pretty under control compared to a lot of places. Um, their systematic mapping and removal of the plants really took off in the mid 1980s. Uh, there were about 125 recorded kudzu sites in 1990, but very little remains in the actual park boundary today. Um, for my uh, Sierra piece, I interviewed Christine Johnson, who's a supervisory forester at Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And she shared how when people are in the backcountry and driving along most of the park roads, um, they'll see very few exotic plants. And she said that's not a miracle, but rather the result of a lot of work. Um, and I think that's a really, we're really fortunate that they've been able to do that work. Um, and we can see what the Smokies really look like without them being taken over by um, mass amounts of multiflora rows, uh, because it is the most biodiverse park in the National Park Service system. And um, so it's really special that um, we get to see all of that and important to protect it. And she also met, talked about um, those new infestations that are always finding their way to the park through either seeds or root fragments. Those can travel by wind. Um, for example, you know, the 100 mile per hour wind she brought up um, during the 2016 fires, um, those can really carry seed sources quite a long way. Um, also birds, waterways, root fragments can come through those waterways especially. Um, and of course, visitors, so muddy boots or equipment, um, that sort of thing is also a way that they're getting into the park. Um, and it was, it was really interesting for me as I was uh, researching this article and talking with Christine, um, learning how invasive plants I was seeing in city environments that seemed really far away um, could theoretically make their way into that park. Um, and so knowing sort of what's around our public land areas is also um, important data to have. All right, so of course, um, this has to come back to my naturalist. Um, how can I naturalist help with this? Well, the key is that it provides an opportunity to link data to education and action. Um, so you may have heard of shifting baseline syndrome before. The term refers to a gradual change in the accepted norms for a natural environment's condition due to a person's lack of experience, memory, or knowledge of its past condition. So, um, for example, multiflora rose can actually be kind of pretty when it blooms, um, as you can see here. Um, and other invasives can be pretty too. But the problem is how they take over and crowd out uh, the rich biodiversity of an area. So um, if you don't know what an area is supposed to look like uh, before one of these plants moves in, um, you may just come to accept that this is what this area looks like instead of doing something to kind of change that and um, help some of those other native plants. Um, when I spoke with Parker Hopkins, who is a natural resource specialist with the Park Service, he shared how he works with different park range, interpretive park rangers um, to create iNaturalist programming um, where people are able to get a hands-on experience where they go out and they identify, they take photos and inter interact with these invasive species while hearing about why, why they're so problematic. Um, so that is, one way that iNaturalist can really um, kind of push back against that 
uh, shifting baseline syndrome and help us uh, continue to protect these spaces. In addition to education, there's the action piece. Um, so the Great Smoky Mountains National Park um, uses data from iNaturalist as well as the um, Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System or EDMAPS, um, which is an invasive specific citizen science project um, from the University of Georgia. They get information from both of those, like crosswalk data from both of those um, databases, and they're able to um, see when a new infestation has cropped up and be able to figure out um, the exact location and what to do about proper removal of that. Um, and then finally, as Parker's quote here notes, um, it's even helpful to track these species outside of the park boundary um, because staff are able to see what might be coming um, and from where so that we can prevent and prepare for that. All right, so um, hopefully you're getting pretty jazzed about using a naturalist to track invasives. Um, but now I'm really excited to talk about Smokey's Most Wanted, uh, which is an initiative that took off in the past couple of years in earnest. Um, it's had some other names prior to, um, but it is, um, it's a really fun way to engage with the Smokies. So we'll, we'll get into that. Um, before we get to why um, the Smokies Most Wanted list is here, um, we need to go over some of the background that led to it. So um, the Smokies partners with a nonprofit called Discover Life in America, and they launched the All Tax the Biodiversity Inventory in 1998, which is an effort to document every single species in the Smokies. Um, and they have already recorded more than 20,000 um, so far, and that's expected to grow by another 40 to 60,000. Um, that data is really neat just for understanding uh, the environment that we have and being able to um, figure out how to best manage and protect it. And it's also um, used for a lot of other projects, such as the Atlas of the Smokies, um, so the ATBI data um, feeds into that, which is a project with the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. All right. Um, and the Atlas of the Smokies is a public online resource that maps the expected locations of a species throughout the park. Um, that's based on those iNaturalist observations, um, so where they geographically are, as well as their habitat characteristics. So slope, geology, um, elevation, forest type, temperature, sun exposure. Um, having those observations helps the team figure out um, what each species prefers and from that extrapolate where throughout the park you're most likely to find them. Um, you need about 30 geographically distinct observations of a species to create the predictive, predicted distribution map. Um, so 30 observations of a species all from Cades Cove, for example, isn't going to cut it, um, but some from Cades Cove, some in Cataluchi, and others scattered throughout the park um, will be able to help with that. Um, and the effort so far has been able to map more than 800 of the species in the park, but we need additional data to be able to expand the effort. Um, so I wanted to show you what this project looks like because I think it's so cool. Um, here I've searched for the parasitic plant beach drops, um, one of my favorites, and the pink areas on the map um, show where you're likely to find the species in the park. Um, you'll see it the legend in the bottom right corner. Uh, the model confidence here is excellent. That means that um, the team has enough observations and they have a lot of that iNaturalist data to feel pretty secure about this distribution map. Um, and it also shows the species density. So the darker the pink is, um, the more of that species you're likely to find in that area. 
but it gets even cooler than this because let's say you want to um, know how beach drops interact with American beech trees. Um, so you can layer that on to the map. Uh, so here I, I chose the compare with another species and I picked the American beach um, and that overlays with the, the beach drops. Um, so it's really neat. Uh, you can add in a, an additional layer to that even if you want. Um, and there's a, a feature where you can just select it to compare with um, kind of light environment um, species as well. So it's a, it's a pretty fun resource. I encourage you to go play around with it um, and know that your iNaturalist data can help even more species become a part of this tool. So um, all the background, what is the Smokies Most Wanted Initiative? Um, in short, the biggest hurdle to getting the iNaturalist data that the park needs um, and that its partners need to make these kinds of resources um, is for people to use iNaturalist. So the park had um, more than 14 million visits in 2021 alone. And if there was just one iNaturalist observation from every one of those visits, that would be an incredible amount of data um, that the park could use. So um, in light of this, uh, Discover Life in America has created the Smokies Most Wanted Guide in iNaturalist um, that lists 100, a little over 100 species that the park has deemed as high priority for collecting more data. Um, and they are doing more of a push around getting people excited about this and seeing it as kind of a, a scavenger hunt you can go on um, throughout the park. So um, they selected the, the species on the list for a variety of different reasons. Um, some are just low hanging fruit. So they're species that you are likely to see, but they just don't have enough data on them. So those are ones that, um, can really get knocked off of this list quickly if more people participate. There are others on the list that are there because um, they want to track um, potential invasive species coming into the park and be able to monitor those. There are also some that are on the list uh, because the park's resource management team has specific questions on them. Um, so such as plants that have cultural significance to the Cherokee or how certain critters might be migrating through the park. Um, yeah, there are, there are um, so many fun species on the list. Um, I have plants highlighted here, of course, but um, they also have birds and insects and all of that as well. So a lot of stuff to explore. Um, the guide, when you pull it up on iNaturalist, um, looks like this. You can scroll through and it'll show you the names and photos and additional information about each of the species. And you can review that list before and during your park adventures to guide your kind of self-led scavenger hunt. Um, Discover Life in America has also been uh, promoting the effort more over at social media and through programming um, and also through a six-part column in the Great Smoky Mountains Association Smoky Life magazine um, by yours truly. And I've linked to a couple of those in um, that resource sheet as well, if you'd like to read that later. Um, and the initiative has been going really well. It's been, um, it's been a fun thing to be a part of and um, see how it's, how it's growing. So iNaturalist uses in the park, um, there were only four users who were, actively using it in the Smokies in 2011. And today we're at over 7,100. Um, there have also been over 104,000 observations logged in the Smokies and 102 new species recorded in the park. Um, some of those are those first um, findings of a species that maybe they thought was in the park, um, but didn't know yet. Um, so some of those are just confirmed that way. Uh, but there are also a few that have been confirmed in the Smokies that are new to science. Um, so they've been able to do some DNA testing and um, have found that they're just the first of their kind. Um, I wrote an article about a salamander species that they 
found in the park um, that is new to science and um, have also linked to that in the resource sheet if you want to read about that. And uh, very exciting, seven of the species on this Smokies Most Wanted list have already been sufficiently documented to be able to be removed from that list. Um, so that means that they have enough data now to start adding that into the Atlas of the Smokies, which is really exciting. Um, so I hope that you're all really jazzed about um, getting out there and being a part of the Smokies Most Wanted initiative. Um, I have a few tips. If you are, um, 100 plus species is a lot to remember and um, can be a little overwhelming. So my suggestion is to familiarize yourself with just a handful from the list that interests you. Um, that way you're kind of already aware of them and you're more in tuned um, if you see them out there and you can be like, oh, I remember that from the list. I can take a picture of that. Um, so for me, I know that the pleasing fungus beetle is on the list. And every time I see them now, um, I make sure to snap a picture. Um, my column in the Smokies Life magazine is also a great way to do this. Um, we dive into three different species from the list in each column um, and give some more background on it. Also, um, the guide should be used as inspiration, but really what's behind this initiative is just getting more people to use iNaturalist in a park. So even if you go out and you take some observations and none of it turns out to be on the list, that's still a success. Um, capture anything that you see, um, all of that is really useful for the park. Um, also, the data that the park tends to get um, concentrates around visitor centers and more popular trailheads. Um, so if, especially if you're on any of the less um, popular trails or areas of the park, um, and especially the North Carolina side of the park, um, take some of my naturalist observations, uh, the park definitely needs more data in those areas. And um, this is one I have to remind myself of often, don't be afraid to make the same observation twice. Um, oftentimes if I walk by something that I've already ID'd before, I already know what it is, um, I won't take the time to stop and do it again. Um, but as I mentioned before, they need 30 geographically distinct data points. Um, so if you saw, if I saw a pleasing fungus beetle in the Sugarlands area, but then I saw one over in Fontana, um, it's important to take both of those observations because that helps with that data extrapolation. Um, and then finally, um, especially during wildflower season, a lot of the showy, um, the most showy species get the most observations, um, which is great. Keep doing it, but also um, you can become a detective for like little insects or plant life that isn't as showy. Um, some of those species need documented as well. So keep an eye out for them. And then um, Discover Life in America also has um, great uh, resources that they've been coming up with and updates um, on their social media. So definitely encourage you to follow them. Um, I've been using their graphics here um, and they're kind of fun. So. Um, follow them for more of that. Okay, so um, that's how you can use iNaturalist to help the Smokies. Um, I can't see any of you right now, so um, I, I hope you followed along with that. Um, I'm going to move into a couple ways that you can use it for just like your personal enjoyment now. Um, I'm going to go through those uh, fairly quickly, and then we'll have some time for questions. So the first one is connection. Um, I love my naturalist because it has really deepened my connection to the Smokies. Um, more than once while I've been hiking in the Smokies, I've had tourists stop me and they ask me, like, when, am, when is the view going to be? <laughs> um, When's the next overlook? Am I gonna be able to see something soon? Um, is there anything to see here? And um, especially during the summertime when the tree canopy is really lush and dense, 
Um, it can seem like you're not seeing what you want to see on a hike. Um, it's definitely not that same alpine vista that you might see in Glacier or those other Western parks. Um, but what I love about the Smokies and what iNaturalist has really driven home for me about them is just how beautiful they are in their details. Um, it is the most biodiverse uh, National Park Service unit. And that's a really special um, thing that we have right here. So I like using iNaturalist just to really hone into um, how much there is to see. And um, as you can see here, this is just a little taste of some of what I've seen on my hikes. Um, the middle there is a collage a friend put together of me enjoying all sorts of fungi <laughs> while I was hiking. Um, and yeah, it's just, a, it's a great way to connect to a place. Um, I think I'm already talking to a group that really enjoys those details, but if you want to kind of take it to another level, um, I think the, that using iNaturalist is a great way to do that. And just to kind of drive this point home, um, I went on a walk on one of the short nature trails in the Smokies one day, and I had iNaturalist with me, and I just wanted to see just how much I could record um, in one place. And this is just part of the list of what I saw within my first 20 yards of walking. Um, I wasn't even counting the trees and the less showy plants. Um, and I captured all of these. So it's a really neat way to get out there and notice just how much detail there is in even a you know, 10 by 10 foot plot. Um, another means for connection when using iNaturalist is through a bio blitz. Um, these are annual or seasonal events uh, that take place on different public lands um, or that groups host. And the goal is to just identify as many species as possible. Um, so kind of what I did on that Little Smokies hike, but more of a community version of that. Um, it's a great way to connect with nature and also with other nature lovers. So. Um, if you're looking to find some like-minded individuals, um, they're a great opportunity. Um, you can learn more about them on the National Geographic website um, and find some that are near you locally to build community. Okay, and my final um, point four for why you should be using a naturalist is um, writing related. Since I'm a nature writer, I had to highlight how I think this is a great tool um, for improving your environmental pieces. Um, if any of you are poets or essayists or otherwise like to like to write. Um, so iNaturalist lets you learn the actual names for the things that you see and hear in your environment. Um, and adding those details can make for much richer scene setting um, in your writing. So Here's an example um, of a first draft. It would be the bird gossiped in the trees with two others. Um, this is a true story. <laughs> um, and I was on this trail. Um, and so then I updated that with the pileated woodpecker clung to a tulip tree in the golden hour canopy gossiping with a barred owl and black throated green warbler. Um, since that one was a little bird heavy, um, I did want to give more of a, um, a plant example too. So um, initial, initial sentence, first draft, the hillside was carpeted with pink and white flowers. And then after you know, learning more about the species that you're looking at, a legion of white trillium carpeted the hillside, its past peak blooms wilting into shades of pink. So notice how iNaturalist can also help you learn details like why some of the flowers are white while some others are pink um, and how that detail can add a sense of both time and season to your writing as well. All right, so, so, so to sum it up, um, incorporating your iNaturalist observations into your writing can give it a richer sense of place and region and can also hint at the season. Um, that you're writing about. It's, I think, um, more beautiful to read um, writing that shows that it's spring in the Appalachian Mountains 
by detailing the specific wildflowers that are in bloom rather than simply saying it's spring in the Appalachian Mountains, right? Um, so I, I love to use iNaturalist in this way. Um, and I am also a bird nerd. So um, Merlin and eBird are um, kind of the bird bird focused version, I'd say of iNaturalist and Seek. And I use those often as well for um, adding some extra detail to my writing. All right, um, so I've made my case for why you should use iNaturalist. Um, where we go from here, um, just download the app and try it out. Uh, re review that Smokey's Most Wanted guide um, and explore your public land and stay tuned for updates from uh, your favorite parks, the Smokies as well, um, and discover life in America. Um, here are some resources I wanted to highlight. They're all in that sheet I shared as well. So if you did wanna just look into more information on the guide or the atlas um, or any of the writing that I mentioned along the way, um, those links are there for you. Um, and then otherwise, I appreciate you uh, all listening to me tonight. Um, I've, it's, it's always an interesting experience talking to a screen for <laughs> this long, um, but I would love to open it up to questions now. And um, if you end up having questions later on, or you wanna hear about other potential workshops, um, also always feel free to reach out to me um, through my website and my emails also on the, the resource list as well. Thank you so much, Corin. Uh, that was a great, great talk. Uh, I learned so much. I had my phone here just whizzing through it, trying to catch up and, and look at all of it and uh, kind of get myself up to speed about it. So, um, but uh, we did have a couple of questions on chat and then I'll open it up to the floor. Uh, so um, what are your, um, this is from Pam Barber. So what are your thoughts about people using the location information to go and steal rare and endangered plants? Yes, um, I meant to add this into my notes, so I'm glad you asked. Um, so there are um, a few protections in place for that. Um, first of all, if it's on a rare plants list or rare species list, um, the app automatically obscures the location data for that. Um, so there's that piece. Um, and then you can also, let me go back to, Um, here we go. So here it is. Um, that piece there that says location visibility open. Um, you can also opt to obscure your own um, data as well. So you can either make it um, private or you can just have it obscured. Um, if you click on that, you'll get those different options. Um, so you can adjust your location data if you're worried about it. Um, and then for those rare species, it'll automatically do that, which I think is very important. Great question. Great question. So uh, we do have another question from Dan Witten. Uh, does the magenta shield turn green after reading the entry? It does. Um, I think it turns gray. Yeah. So all of those ones that are gray um, are ones that I've already opened and looked at the comment section for. Um, and then they go back. So, um, yep. Right. Good, good. Um, so, um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, one of the questions I have is, uh, when we go look at the different guides, there's guides from all over things from all over the planet. So how do you save those guides to your, to your, uh, favorites or something like that? So you can go back to them. Uh, great question. Um, I know I've done it. <laughs> um, oh, actually, you know, I've added in projects that I haven't, I don't think I have been able to save a guide. My, my instinct is that it's one of those features that is a little bit clunky in the app. Um, so my recommendation would be to go on the website version and I'm, I bet you can save them there okay. for reference. 
Um, but that's something I'll have to I'll have to play around a little bit with too. Because I usually end up just searching for the Smokies Most Wanted Guide and going back to it that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. I'm getting ready to go to Costa Rica, and so I'd like to have a guide down there. So mm -hmm. it'd be wonderful. So great. Thank you. Let's see what other questions we have here. Um, so uh, let's see here. Um, uh, so John Johnson wrote, if I have observations already uh, in SEEK, can I sync them to our naturalist? I think that you should be able to. Um, I haven't used SEEK before, so um, I don't have a, a definite answer for that. Um, I'd be happy to help poke around on some, some of the FAQs and stuff and find an answer, but I, I think you should be able to. Gotcha. Uh, so Dan asked another question, uh, and I think it's a good one. Uh, is the North Carolina side of the Smoky less visited, thus less documented? And does I naturalist enable you to find how many species of ferns are there in the Smokies? Yes. Um, so the, the North Carolina side of the park um, in general is less documented. Um, and then just, you kind of get away from the Sugarlands area and um, some of the popular trailheads and um, definitely less documented out there. The Fontana area I've noticed doesn't have as many um, docu documented species. Um, if you are interested in looking at where a species has shown up in iNaturalist um, already, um, I think the the best way to do it is through the website version. Um, you can search for that species and then put uh, Great Smoky Mountains as the location. And that'll pull up a map and it'll show you, it'll have it dotted out everywhere that there is um, an observation of that species and both for research grade and, and um, casual grade. So that's, I do that sometimes too when I'm curious where I might find something in the park um, and also just kind of noticing um, whether an observation I found is new for that region. It's kind of fun to see. Right, and uh, so Chris Sermon asked, you know, is the desktop version more more or different features than the uh, than the phone app? Yeah, so it's just a little. Um, parts of it can just be a little more user friendly. So um, I'd say one of the main features is being able to see that. Um, those distribution maps in iNaturalist. I don't think there is a way to do that in the app. Um, so that's one feature that's unique to the website. Um, it's also a little bit easier to see some of the activity, I, I think. Um, I've had some users leave more detailed comments on why they suggested a different species than I had recommended. Um, and I wasn't able to see that in the app for some reason, but when I logged into the website, um, I saw it. I don't know if they've kind of worked out some of those glitches over time. Um, but I'd say that the website is, is mostly just um, if you want to dig into more of the detail, it's it's an easier kind of process that way. Thank you. And one last question. Um, so where are you at? Where are you at in your efforts to hack all the designations in the park? <laughs> I'm getting there. Um, I have probably a 180 miles left or so. Um, so I'm aiming to finish uh, sometime in the spring. Okay, great, great. Sounds like an adventure for sure. Uh, <laughs> so that's all the questions that we have on the chat. Do we have any other questions from the from the from the room? I'll see Doug Lockhart. Doug. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, Corin, that my brains are on fire. What a marvelous presentation. Uh, yeah, I suspected that I'm actually had a lot more to offer than I've been able to scratch out of it. You know, I'm kind of technologically challenged, but uh, I only had about a thousand ideas of how we could, you know, use this tool as a, uh, you know, an exchange of information uh, here in South Carolina to help advance our mission in South Carolina Native Plant Society. Uh, for encouraging diversity in our uh, habitats down here, the restoration of native plants, suppression of invasive plants, all that information. Uh, 
And I just wanted to ask you, if, if we nominated like one candidate, would you be willing to mentor one of our people to help us launch a program and learn more about how to use this tool effectively? Yeah, I would, I would love that. <laughs> okay. That would be awesome. Thanks so much for tonight's presentation. I'm, I'm yeah. really impressed. Thank and very you. inspirational. Thank you, Doug. Anyone else? I see, I have another one from Carrie. So Rick, Rick, it's, huh. it's not really a question. I was just sharing, I've, I've told some folks this story when I was still living in Texas, I was just taking a walk in my neighborhood, which was kind of a rural area and saw a plant I knew I'd never seen before. So I took an iNaturalist observation and, and not too long after that, it was in the, ended up in the collection for the Botanical Research Institute of Texas because it was uncommon enough, they thought it was worthy, worthy of taking a sample. Um, they, they actually mentioned me in the notes of their digital uh, herbarium. So it's like, that's one, my, my 15 minutes of fame happened to be digital. So, <laughs> so, so if you use INET, maybe you'll get your 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Well, uh, I think that's all of our questions. I did want to uh, give a shout out uh, to our, uh, our next month's meeting is going to be our Christmas party, which is going to be, should have the information in the newsletter and on the website. It's going to be at the Croc Center in Greenville down off, I believe it's Hudson Street, uh, and, or in that area in downtown Greenville. Uh, which I think it's going to be a great venue. We're going to have a, a, a dirty Santa event. Uh, and so one of the rules for the Croc Center is that, um, uh, we can bring food, but it just can't be home prepared for whatever reason. We can buy it at Ingles or whatever and bring it, but we can't cook it ourselves and uh, and bring it. So, but it's, we should have a good venue there. Judy, uh, do you have any uh, other, other comments about the agenda for the program? Judy Seeley. Well, maybe Judy's not there. Uh, we'll have some, you know, other events at, there at the at it. Well, we'll have a lot of fun with it. We usually have a lot of games and things we play with it. And so, it's been the first time we've met live in a few couple of years. So we're all real excited about seeing everybody. And uh, so, please make your plans to come out and join us for our Christmas party, December thirteenth, at seven o'clock. Thanks, Corinne. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Corinne. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Great Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Not everybody. I enjoyed it. Thank you.